Well, uh, we're starting a new series today. If you have your Bible, uh, I'm going to start in the book of Ecclesiastes. And I'm just saying that on the front end because it's a tiny little guy uh, and it's kind of hard to find. And so if you want to follow along in your Bible and you want to find Ecclesiastes, uh, can I open your Bible to the middle? You should be in Psalms somewhere. Uh, usually Psalms is right in the middle of your Bible. And then Ecclesiastes is two books to the right. So Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Um, I, I have a, a kind of a love-hate relationship with music. I, I would like to do a poll right, real quick. Uh, just show of hands or like a, I don't know, like a Texan yeehaw if, you, if you're just feeling real giddy. Uh, you know, who here just really enjoys music? You love music? You're good with music? Okay, you, you like music? Good, good, great, great. Uh, of, of those who love music, raise your hand if you happen to be the type of person who really loves music but is also extremely terrible at it. Any, anybody else? Oh, you, you are my people. I love it. Yes, that's me. I, I, I love music. I love that music can kind of transport my mind and my thinking and my heart to places that if you just told me the story, like if you just told me the math of the thing, it won't matter. But if you play, I don't know, uh, uh, like some Nirvana, I'm just like, okay, I can, I can follow along with this moment, this story. Uh, in sixth grade, I tried out for band uh, because I'm, uh, I'm one of the cool kids. And uh, in sixth grade, I, I, I did really good with band. Uh, uh, I uh, ended up on trombone. I wanted to be a drummer, but all the drummers were taken care of. And I immediately excelled at playing the trombone. And, you know, that's, that's really interesting because I'm terrible at music now. Uh, I was first chair the entire sixth grade year as a trombone player. Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I am a bit of a big deal. Um, and, and so at the end of sixth grade, uh, we go into summertime. I take my trombone home. I left it in its case. I did not open that case all summer long. And we go into seventh grade, and it's like, everybody bring your instruments, and I strut in because I'm first here trombone player. I know where to sit. I sit in my spot. I'm doing great. And it's like, it's time for a chair test. Okay, I'm, I've got this. I did great last year. I didn't even try. Uh, we go for the chair test, and it turns out I'm the only kid who didn't practice all summer. And in the first chair test of seventh grade, I went from first seat to next to last seat, which means I didn't go to the worst, but I came really, really close, which may or may not have set a record for the number of seats switched in one moment from, from first seat seat to next to the worst is, um, uh, you know, that is, that is what it is. Uh, in in uh, my 20s, I'm a youth pastor in Dallas, the first church that I served at. It was a small Baptist church. Uh, many of you probably grew up in small Baptist churches uh, with the hymns and the, the choir and the pianist, and, you know, we have all the things. And uh, this church has this, uh, this, this tradition that we're going to do a Christmas choir. It's called a Christmas cantata, which is not to be confused with a Christmas cantata. Cantana, which is a sword, and I won't make that mistake again. Uh, but but I'm in the Christmas cantata because I'm on staff at the church. It's required. And, and I'm just not good. Like, I, I'm somewhere between, like, a bass and a, a soprano or a soprano or something. And I'm, I'm just, I, I have no idea what those words mean. I, I just can't sing. And, and about the third or fourth practice, the director calls me over, like, one of those, hey, I'm going to give you one tip, you know, one of those secret tips to, like, square everything up. And he looks at me, and he kind of starts, and, and he stops, and he says, well, you got to, have you thought, uh, it's just not working out. You should drop out of the band. And I got kicked out of the Christmas cantata, the first person on staff to just like, it's just not going to work out. You're done. You know, we're going to, we're going to kick you out. I'm just, I'm bad at music, and I, and I love music. Um, one of the, the highest number of texts I received after giving a message, which is really encouraging, by the way. I don't know if you know this, but like if, if someone says something in the music or in the sermon, it's just like, man, that, that meant something. When you get that text, it just kind of bolsters your spirit. And the, the, one of the sermons that had the highest number of texts was one of the sermons where they forgot to mute my mic during the worship set. <laughs> and and it, was, it was muted in the house, but over the live stream. Now, it exists on the internet somewhere. I don't know where, uh, and I hope it gets deleted, but it exists somewhere where I am belting out louder than the rest of the band, uh, and they're just like, you've got to stop. The cats are crying. It's, it's, just, it's just really, really bad. Um, music is something that I enjoy, but I'm not good at it. And uh, I, I'm, we're getting ready to start this series called Find the Melody, uh, Living in Harmony with God. And I just wanted to look at music as a whole. And um, I, I looked at, you know, there's, there's like music theory classes that you can take in college, and there's a lot of different ways to define music. I'm sure there's 
other ways than what I'm about to show you, but there's basically, they say, what I've researched anyway, there's basically like four main elements to music, that if you learn these four elements, think of them like dials that you can turn in different ways, you can make any song in the world, uh, and you can be a talented musician. Um, those four elements will be on the screen behind me are melody, harmony, rhythm, and dynamics. Now, I'm sure someone in here is like, Jesse, you forgot the fifth and the sixth one. I don't know what they are. I didn't know what these were until Google told me, but, but melody, harmony, rhythm, and dynamics. Melody is a coherent succession of pitches or notes. That's the, that's the you know, the key, ding, ding, you know, kind of doing its thing, it, but it's coherent. That's where I've always messed up. I would play random notes, but it's not coherent. Harmony is the relationship of those pitches or those notes as they sound simultaneously, that, that there's certain things that sound good when they play together, yeah? And then there are certain things, like me on the trombone, that when they're played together, they just don't sound right. Um, followed by rhythm, this is the time that the music is supposed to be played, the note is supposed to be played. If I'm supposed to play a G right now in the song, uh, I, need to, I need to play it at exactly the right time. Because I think we've all been to the, you know, the middle school band concert where like the G is played and it sounds perfect, but it's about three seconds too early and it's like, you know, it just it lets out in your ear knows that your soul cries a little in that moment when the note is played out. And the dynamics is, uh, it's kind of the, the, the loudness of it, like uh, the crescendos and the fatissimos and all the other Italian words that I don't know, that it rises and it falls. And, you know, when you have that moment in the song where it's building, it's building, it's building, and then there's this long pause and you're, you're like, when's the next note? You know, and there's like, it feels like an eternity in that, but it's meant to create longing in your heart. And then it dives into the next bit to the bridge. <laughs> yeah, the musicians are, yeah, I use the word bridge. That's, that's good. This is, this is the four basic elements of music. Now, um, this isn't a music theory class. And what I just gave you was incredibly sterile. Like it's very academic. Uh, in the hands of me, these are just facts that I can type and put on a screen. But if I handed this knowledge to a talented musician and they know how to turn the knobs, they can take a random assortment of sounds and put them in the right place play them in the right order at the right timing with the right amount of breath and air between the notes. And they can turn what is just chaotic noise into a symphony. A talented musician can, can write a ballad, can, can write a, a, an opera, can, can do a country song or a rap song, just turning these four knobs into any which way um, to make any song that they want. Did anybody watch um, on Marvel, uh, on Disney Plus, on Marvel, uh, WandaVision? Anybody watch WandaVision? It's, it's been out for a while. Uh, WandaVision is kind of a trip. It's a mind trip. Every episode, I'm just, you know, letting you know how the, how the story sets up. Every episode is like a different genre of TV show. Like it starts with like an I Love Lucy kind of a feel. And then the next episode is a full house feel. And then the next episode is a, a Malcolm in the Middle feel. Like each one is meant to look like a different sitcom. And at the end, they do like a marvel superhero, like ties it all together. When the show was finished, I was just randomly perusing YouTube and it turns out out that the people who wrote the music for WandaVision, they wrote four notes. The, all of the music in WandaVision is built around these four notes. That would be the melody. And every song, every theme song, it's the same four notes. You can just Google this and you can watch the YouTube video. It's like three minutes long. That They have like a 1950s feel using those four notes. And then like a full house, 90s, everybody happy feel with those same four notes. And then, and then when it got to Malcolm in the Middle, like the chaotic late 90s of just, it's like kind of a little bit of electric, a little bit of rock, but it's the same four notes. And these musicians, they were like, yeah, we, we decided that these four notes are for WandaVision, and we're just going to blend them into the song. And we're going to blend them into the show in random places. I, I love that. Like, talented musicians can tell a story with just four notes, and then they turn the knobs every which way to accomplish their goals. Um, I, have, I have young kids. I have a, an 11-year-old and a 5-year-old. We went and watched the Mario movie, uh, which was great. I don't know if you know the Mario movie. If you don't know the Mario movie, surely you know the Peaches song by now. Does anybody know the Peaches song? 
The Peaches song is great. The story of the Peaches song is this. Um, Jack Black, he plays Bowser in Mario. Uh, and Jack Black is just the voice actor. And he's going to be the voice actor. He was hired to do the voice acting. And then somewhere along in the voice acting shoot, the, the, the makers of the Mario movie come and say, hey, Jack Black, you are a musician. Can you give us a song? And he's like, well, I guess. And he writes this rapid song called Peaches, which is now, there's a really good chance. I'm just, spoiler alert, there's a really good chance Jack Black is going to get a Grammy for the Peaches song. Like, it's really a front contender for the Peaches song. And then after the movie comes out, they've done some research, and it's like, here is how Jack Black built this song, and it's just the genius of it. I just, if I could, give you 15 seconds. This is a, a TikToker that um, he, he samples music, and he kind of breaks it down for you, and I think this is really good to kind of make my point today, if you can play that. Peaches, 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 peaches. <laughs> This is the chord progression. It goes G flat major, A flat major, F minor seven to B flat minor. What that basically is is like four, five, three, six. Turns out Jack Black is going to get a Grammy by Rick rolling the entire nation all at the same time. Nobody knew that that was the Rick Astley song, and yet there it is hidden in the Peaches song. It's, it's just four notes. It, it turns out that music, if you give it to someone who's skilled, they can do amazing things with just four notes. What if, what if your life is more like a song than you realize? What if your life exists in the middle of a melody that's been playing since the beginning of time, since the beginning of creation, just these same notes keep coming up over and over again, and then your life is either a choice to join in with the symphony or to do your own thing and just make a chaotic noise as it were. I want to, I want to try to unpack this idea that God from the beginning of time has been hitting the same few notes over and over and over again. And the people whose lives are in the most harmony are the ones who realize that and begin, they just lean into it. They, they learn to play the part in the season that it's in. Everybody goes through seasons. It, it is wise to understand the season of life that you're in and to lean into it. So, um, Grace, to your point, it took me two weeks to make this into a sermon. She's like, when are you going to bring the boot into a sermon? It can't take long. Uh, I broke my talus bone. I don't know when. I don't know how. It's been months now of a broken bone I've been walking around on. And so I've started wearing this boot trying to get it better. Now, if I decided tomorrow, you know what, I want to start training for a marathon, it's probably a bad time for Jesse to start training for a marathon or a 10K or a 5K or just to run around the block because I, the reality is the season that I'm in is I've got the broken talus bone and I have to, I have to you know, honor that. I have to live within that. It would, I would do more damage if I forced myself into a different season than what I'm actually in. And so what we want to do with this series is called Find the Melody, is that we want to, we want to with, with, you know, 2020 vision, try to catch a glimpse of this melody, this season uh, that, that God is, uh, that we're in with God's, uh, you, know, you know, symphony, if you will, um, and, and try to unpack that over the next seven weeks. Uh, I want to look in Ecclesiastes 3 uh, and, and uh, begin this as kind of a way to, to understand uh, this idea. Ecclesiastes, is written by a guy who identifies himself as the preacher, which is just great. Like He's like, I am the preacher, which just sounds like a superhero. Uh, and then he says that he's also the son of David, so, and also a former king of Israel. So uh, most people just think it's Solomon using the name the preacher. Uh, Solomon is known for writing most of Proverbs. Uh, he's uh, supposed to be a very wise and smart man with a lot of, of wisdom to pass along. And so Ecclesiastes is his... Um, uh, a memoir, if you will, of just finding wisdom in the world. Um, it is an incredibly sad and depressing book until you get to the last chapter because all of Ecclesiastes is him trying to find joy in the things that everybody seems to be finding joy in. I'm going to find joy in money. I'm going to find joy in women. I'm going to find joy in partying. I'm going to find joy in power. And every time he ends it, the phrase is, it's vanity, vanities, useless, useless. He's like, it's always, everything's useless. Everything's really dark. Because everything under the sun has its ultimate purpose in, in God. But here, here's what he says in chapter 3. He says, 
uh, verse 1. He says, for everything, for everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. For everything, there is a season uh, and a time for every matter under heaven. Spikes Sturdivant, one of our elders here, he's had this quote. He said it like four times through a text and in a conversation that a season means appointed time. I like that. That's a good, uh, Spikes, uh, if you're watching online, he's, he's at the lake right now. Um, there, everything has a season. Everything has an appointed time. Every, every moment of your life has its rightful place in, in creation. He says everything has a season. There's a season and a time for every matter under heaven. And then for the next seven or eight verses, he just starts to lay out all these different seasons you may find in your life. I wonder, I wonder if you know what season you're in right now. What part of the song is your life in right now? Here, here are the seasons that um, the preacher gives. He says, verse 2, there's a time to be born and a time to die. Well, that's, that's the beginning and the end of it all, isn't it? Uh, there's a time to be born, yeah. There's a time to die. Let's start to fill in the gaps in between. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. Uh, these, are, these become like poetic uh, kind of rhyming uh, uh, ideas, but you know, there's a time to put something in the garden and there's a time to go get your vegetables out. You can't go get the cucumbers out of the garden before you plant them, right? Um, that, would be, that would be foolish. And yet we try to get blessings out of different areas of our life before we've planted them. That's sort of the, the imagery that he has. Verse 3, there's a, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Uh, who wants that verse 4 in their life? Oh, Jesse, I just want the laughing and the dancing part, right? Well, yeah, so do I. But that's, you don't get to choose the song. You don't get to choose the season. There, there are times where you are a maniac if you're laughing. Um, ask the people who I did the first funeral for. You don't, you, they don't want a lot of jokes at the funerals, it turns out, um, because it's not the time for laughing, and I was uncomfortable, and I tend to make jokes when I'm uncomfortable. There's a time for mourning, too, Jesse. There's a time for grieving, and see, Solomon, I'm going to keep going here in a moment, he, he's kind of throwing out these different seasons, and he's, he's wanting you to consider this idea that your greatest joy might not be in rushing to the dancing, but mourning when it's time to mourn. Your greatest satisfaction in life is to play the season that you're in, or in the metaphor that I'm using, the melody, to play the part that you're in right now. He says in verse 5, there's a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. That, that last line, there, there's a time to um, uh, build relationships and there's a time to set firm boundaries with people and to know the difference is to be wise, uh, to try to force or pretend that, oh, I don't need a boundary, let's, let's just... You know, let's pretend it didn't happen. Jesus had a lot to say about that in the Sermon on the Mount. Don't cast your pearls before swine lest they turn and bite you. Uh, boundaries are good. Verse 6, a time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. You, you know, there's a time where you should open your mouth and say a thing. And there's a lot of times where all that is required of us is to keep our mouth closed. And in those moments, to open our mouth causes more damage than if we just kept silence. And the same is true the other way. There are times where we should speak up, but in fear or hesitation, we keep silent. That's the time to speak up. There's wisdom in knowing what season we're in. Verse 8, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. This, uh, this little poem that the preacher writes here is, uh, it, it, a lot of people have pondered it over the years. If, if you grew up in the 60s, you may know the song from the birds, uh, turn, 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 exclamation point, exclamation point. They're quoting Ecclesiastes in that song. To everything, see, I can't sing. Turn, turn, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, can, I can, like, I'm flashing back to, like, bell bottoms and, like, hippie movies I've seen um, that, that, even in the music of the 60s and all the chaos that was there, people are grabbing the story of Ecclesiastes and say, well, hold on, just like, what season are we in? Is this the season for love or the season for war? And the people who get it wrong, the people who are unwise, try to force their agenda on a moment. 
Let's keep going. Verse 9 says, what gain has the worker from his toil? This is a great question, by the way. Uh, this is a very, very Ecclesiastes-like uh, to, to just ask questions like that that we're meant to stop and ponder. Why do you work? What gain is it to you? What, what is the point of you going out into the fields or you going to, to work and putting on the tie? What is the point of you going into the refineries or you going into the shop that day? Like, why is it that you work? And when we are unwise and when we're kind of running into different seasons, we, oh, well, we work because that's who I am. You, you, know, you, know, why, you know why I go to work? Because I'm the pastor. I'm, I'm the pastor. I, I am the pastor. I'm, I'm not really, though. I mean, this isn't a weird confession. It's just a, a different way of thinking it. My identity is not this role right here. Your identity it's not the job you have. It's not your station in your family. And when we make the mistake of thinking that it is, and we try to hold on to seasons instead of passing through into the next one. So what, what gain has the worker from his toil? Verse 10, now I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He's like, I know a thing or two. I've, I've been, any people watchers out there? You just go to the mall and you're, you're like, you start to judge people right away and you, you give them a backstory like, ah, I bet she had a terrible childhood. You know, you just think things as, as it goes. This guy right here, he is, is people watching. He's like, I've, I've been people watching and I think I know what God's been doing. He, he says, he says I, I, know, I know what God's given to the children of man to be busy with. Verse 11, we referenced this a few weeks ago. He has made everything beautiful in its time, everything in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. He, this, this verse I said last time, like, we need to build a whole sermon out of it. I think we just accidentally built it into this series that he's put eternity into God's heart. Here's, here's why we have longings and hopes when we go into mourning. Why is, why is mourning and grieving bad? Why are we uncomfortable in arguments and satisfied when the argument is over? Why are we wired to all agree that murder is evil? No matter what we hold to religiously, like all of humanity says murder is evil, what Solomon would say is that he's put eternity into our hearts. What Paul would say later is that he wrote on our hearts the, the law of God. What some musicians have said is that we have inside us this, this echo of Eden, this echo of the beginning of time when all things were perfect, where the melody was set at the very beginning. And, and all through creation, we're wanting to get back to that perfect harmony that was in Eden. And the entire story of Scripture from beginning to end is God's attempt. God's uh, attempt sounds like he's maybe going to win, maybe not. God's actual process of working us back into that equilibrium, that perfect harmony that was in Eden. Verse 14, skip down to verse 14. It says, I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. The wisest man in the world, as he's like people watching, he says, you know, I think, I think there's a season, there's a time for this, and there's a time for that. There's a time to grieve and a time to rejoice. And they, he sits back, he says, you know who's done this? God has done this. The thing that God is up to in all of creation, that he's been working on since before you were alive, since before your great-grandparents, the thing he's been working on in your family is that we would find ultimately how to live in harmony with him and the work that he's doing, that we would find peace in this life. Let me ask you this. Have you found the melody in your life? Have you found how to live in harmony with what's going on around you? Or is your life a lot of striving for last year's season and trying to hurry up and get to, to the next season? You, you will find more satisfaction in your life if, if, you, if you identify this is the season for this, um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to do this moment. I, I, I said earlier I have kids. I say it every week because, I mean, as a dad, like it's the only 
thing I get illustrations from. I have kids. And uh, one day, uh, when my oldest was nine months old, he found out how to climb out of his baby pen. He just, like, he could climb out. And that was the day I realized uh, I am done playing Xbox. I can no longer, like, he's going to run around the house. He's going to jump on the game. He had this thing where he liked to turn the TV off. And as long as he was in his playpen, I could watch, I could be dad and watch him and play my games because I enjoyed playing games before I had kids. Um, I, I really haven't played anything since, since that was 11 years ago. Uh, why? Because the season of life that I entered uh, included a lot of watching kids. And, um, you know, there's also a lot of like driving kids to sports events and there's a lot of like appointments. Oh my gosh, the doctor's appointments with these kids, like the shots and the crying and the teeth and oh man. Uh, and there's a lot of me, if I had to be honest with you, there's a lot of me is like, you know, like I could be frustrated. I want this other season where I had all this freedom and I could do this. But uh, there's a youth pastor, his name is Doug Fields, and he was talking to youth pastors at different ages. And he said, he said, you would be foolish to try to hang on to that last season where you had all that freedom and, and do this or try to rush to the next season. He says, if you're the dad who's taking kids to soccer, that becomes your, your ministry event. Like, this is the space that you're in. The people that you're sitting to in the stands, that is your community. Uh, Here at Carpenter's Way, our mission statement is that we are called to influence our community. And you're like, well, what's our community? It's wherever you are. In this season, with an 11-year-old and 5-year-old, my community looks like a lot of parents of 11-year-olds and 5-year-olds. One day, I'm going to be a grandparent. It's going to be a completely different season. I would be a fool to be like, I'm hanging out at the soccer fields today, and I'm just going to, I don't have any kids out there. That's like, that's like a grown man playing in a kiddie pool in the front yard. If it's a four-year-old playing in the kiddie pool, it's like, oh, that's sweet, that's cute. But if I'm out there in my trunks, in my front yard, playing in a kiddie pool, you're going to call the cops because it's not right. It's not the right season for, of life for that. And in our lives, uh, in, in the funny ways and in the more serious ways, are, uh, they're, they're call, there's a call for us to understand what season we're in, to identify it, like Solomon did right here. I learned uh, as I was working out this series, I was thinking about the idea of a symphony. Symphony is this beautiful, magical, like orchestral, everything has a part. The conductor, he's doing that mode right there, which like, come on, does that take any skill at all? Can we just be honest? Like it's the 150 people in front of him that are talented. This guy, he's just, you know, working out. But, but the difference is that every, every part, every instrument has its place knows when to play its song. And when he does like, whew, like that, and there goes the tubas, he's like, whew, there goes the flutes. And it's just, it, I, I'm getting this like Mickey Mouse vibe right now where, of wearing the wizard hat. Um, that's called a symphony. But if you take all the same notes, all the same sounds, and you're just like, hey, you guys do whatever you want. You play that drum as loud as you want, Billy. And you play the horn as loud as you want. Just whenever, just, just come on in. That's not a symphony. There's a word for it though. It's a great word. Get this. This is a 10 cent word. It's called a cacophony. A cacophony. Look at this right here. A cacophony is a harsh, discordant mixture of sounds, whereas a symphony is an elaborate musical composition. The only difference in those two words is not the notes, it's not the musical instruments, it's not even the people in the room. It's that they know when to play their part. They have someone who's directing them and they're following this guy doing this mode. And they're like, okay, it's my turn. Here I come. And he brings it in. This is, this is why I don't play music because I play the music notes in the wrong place. So let me ask again, have you found the melody? Is your life a symphony, more like a symphony or more like a cacophony where all the notes just hit and you're like, I don't know, I'm just trying my best. I'm flailing. What if, what if you don't need new notes? What if you don't need new instruments? What if all we need is to take the notes, the musical talent, I keep using that metaphor, just our lives, the skills that we have, and we need someone to point us into how to play them in the right place in the right way. Let me close with uh, Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. If you want to turn there, you can. Uh, Paul kind of highlights this, this point. I, I've referenced this verse, oh man, uh, probably... 10 times in the last couple of years. I, I just, this passage is like a key passage in the way that I think through things. Um, I found a lot of encouragement from thinking through life in this lens. But Ephesians 2, uh, verse 8 begins this way uh, It says, For by grace you have been saved. So let's pause real quick. Um, who's, who's he talking to? What kind of person? 
maybe, I, I think everyone should listen, but for by grace you have been saved. And so it's gonna be, it's gonna be saved people that, that we're wanting to highlight. What does it mean to be saved? Uh, another way of saying that is Christian. If, if you call yourself a Christian, or if you, what we say a lot around here, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, this message that he's about to give is really to tell you like how that happened, how you came from not saved to saved, and then really what the point of it is, like what your part in life now is. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Paul is saying the same thing that the author of Ecclesiastes says, like God did this. God, God's the one who made a way. If you've ever confessed Jesus as Lord, think about this. You heard the name of Jesus at some point. You had a heart that became soft to surrender to the ways of Jesus rather than your own ways. To call him Lord, to call Jesus Lord is to say, I'm, I've made a mess of my life. Uh, I've been Lord of my life for a while. You're now Lord. You do what you want. I'm going to follow your lead. This, uh, Paul is saying that's all a gift. Your ability to do that, your knowledge to know how to do that, that's a gift. That faith comes from him. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Verse 9, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Um, the, this idea that no one's going to brag about being a Christian or being saved. Uh, going back to that symphony, I'm the conductor, you're the, you're the musical number, and I'm doing this. And at the end of the symphony, at the end of it, where you know that moment where everybody stands and they take a bow, and the guy with the wand, he kind of puts it out to the side like that? What if the guy in third seat trombone over there is like, yeah, I did it? That would be really dumb, wouldn't it? It's all of us. We're all a part of it. The conductor was the one leading the way. But just the third trombone guy is like, I'm the best there ever was. Um, no, no one can boast. No one can brag about it. But why? Here's, here's what it says in verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. The Greek word for that is poema. I used to say poemia, but it's poema. Uh, does anybody have a different translation? Uh, mine says workmanship. Does anybody have something else? Three, two, one. Workmanship is the, the most common. Sometimes it's handiwork. We are his handiwork. One, one translation says we are his masterpiece. I really like that. We are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works. This word poema is where we get the word poem from. So if you're a poet, if you're a musician, this is kind of the root of that. And it only occurs twice in the Bible, uh, right here and in Romans 1. In Romans 1, uh, it talks about we can know the attributes of God, his, his masterpiece majesty, his glory, his beauty, his power because of the poema, because of the things that he's created. It's fully aware. So that's the first time it's used in Romans 1. And this is the second time that we, you and I, those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, are his workmanship, his poema. Um, that word, workmanship isn't a bad translation, but in, in American like English, it just sounds so sterile. The, the idea here is, is more like masterpiece. The idea here is, is a magnificent piece of art. This is, this is you hand the block of marble to Michelangelo, and when he's finished and he's carved David out, it is a poema. It is his masterpiece. It is, it is the workmanship of his hands meant to stand the test of time. And you can go to whatever museum it's in right now and still look at it. We are his masterpiece. We are his workmanship. We are his poema. We are his symphony. We're not a cacophony. He wants to work out in his people. God wants to work out in his people a beautiful piece of work that is going to be a blessing to all. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Here's, here's the goal of maturity in, in Christ, and this is kind of how we're going to introduce this series. Um, we're to understand that we're not an accident. Your station in life is not an accident. The family you were born into and the family you're growing into, those are not accidents. The area of the world that we live in is not an accident. You're like, well, Jesse, I chose to move here from Idaho six years ago. Yeah, that's great, but why? <laughs> why didn't all of Idaho move here? Why did you have the idea? Because there's something going on that is bigger than any one of us. And when we try to do the good works that we prepare for ourselves beforehand, we're like that one guy in the band who's just playing the instrument any which way he wants. The symphony sounds off and everybody immediately knows it. That's many of the reasons why we have a lack of satisfaction. But if we learn to play our part, 
Understand the season that we're in. Right now, it's time for me to put my trombone down and just sit. Because it's not the trombone time to play. Oh, here it comes. Oh, he's pointing at me. Here comes that wand. And then for the good works that God has prepared beforehand for you to do. There are things that as a follower of Jesus, you are the only one that's been gifted, skilled, and talented, and equipped to accomplish. And it's like this hoop with your name on it. It's like, hey, this is your time. Now either walk into it or don't play your part in the song. We're going to try to unpack this for the rest of the series. I want to end with just a kind of a thought to meditate on as, as we consider this. We want, to, we want to get eyes to see what season we're in. And um, just, just consider this. If you want a life of harmony, and who doesn't? Who, anybody here is like, nah, I really like this chaos. It's working for me. No, like everybody wants a life of harmony. It's the effort of all of humanity. If you want a life of harmony, you must first find the melody. And just like WandaVision, the same four notes were coming out. It turns out like God has been playing the same notes since the beginning of creation. And then as his poem, as his masterpiece, as his, symph- excuse me, as his symphony, we get to play our part. We get to do the good works that God prepared beforehand. For the next several weeks, we're going to uh, kind of unpack that idea a little bit more. We're going to look more about what those notes are next week. And then we're going to start to identify specific seasons that you may find yourself in now or one day. Seasons like parenting and singleness and marriage. And we want to, we want to say, okay, in that season, what is our part? What is, what is a mature way to follow Christ? But for now, let's just have this idea. If we're going to find harmony in our lives, we must first have eyes to see what the melody that's being played is. And maybe your prayer this week is that you just ask God to give you eyes like, what are you up to, God? Why is it that I keep circling back to that same note, that same moment, that same piece of the song? Oh, oh, it's, I, need to, I need to respond this way now. Maybe the Lord is trying to catch your attention. Let me pray, and then we will watch the cue together. Uh, Father, um, you, you, you are God, and you're creator. Uh, you've been wise in how you've created things in order from the very beginning of time. Um, Lord, we are, we are limited, and we are finite, and we don't have the vantage point to know all the things that you do. Uh, Lord, thank you that you've called us to be a part of this masterpiece of creation, the cosmos, as it were. Um, Lord, help us to learn to play our parts well. Give us the courage to know when to play and when to be quiet. Um, Lord, I pray, Father, for the men and women in here that we would, uh, we would get some clarity on what season we're in, as Ecclesiastes says, and just, just lean into it and to know that you're our God on both the mountaintop and the valley. You're our God in the morning and in the celebration. You're our God in every season of life. Um, help us. Help us to know how to play our parts in those moments. Help us to know what our good works are. Uh, Lord, I pray that in that clarity, uh, our, our people would find peace and rest um, in harmony. And we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.